in the race for AI, who's winning, America or China? If the answer is America, how close is China to us? And what do we do to make sure the answer remains America will win? The United States has a lead today in what is a close race and a race that will likely remain close. The number one factor that will define whether the United States or China wins this race is whose technology is most broadly adopted in the rest of the world. This is a global market and it will be defined as technology markets typically are by network effects. 18% of the people in the world live in China, 4% live in the United States, 78% live somewhere else. The lesson from Huawei and 5G is whoever gets there first will be difficult to supplant. We need to export with the right kinds of controls. We need to win the trust of the rest of the world. We need to have the financial architecture that gets not only to the countries that are industrialized, but the nations, say, across Africa, where typically China and Huawei have done so well. You talk about how we can build models that can better detect harmful deep fakes, Mr. Smith. Yeah, I mean, we're doing that. OpenAI is doing that. A number of us are. And I think the, the goal is to you know, first identify content that is generated by AI. Uh, and then often it is to identify what kind of content is harmful. And I think we've made a lot of strides in our ability to do both of those things. Um, there's a lot of work that's going on across the private sector in partnership with groups like NICMEC to then uh, you know, collaboratively identify that kind of content so it can be taken down. Um, we've been doing this in some ways for 25 years since the internet, and we're going to need to do more of it. It seems to me that on the consumer side, that one of the most basic rights of a user on the internet is to understand what they're looking at or listening to and whether or not it was created solely by a person, a person using an AI, or automatically generated using AI. Do you think a labeling regime, not a prohibition on the use of AI, but just the disclosure, uh, especially as it relates to images, music, creativity, do you think a label would be helpful for consumers? Uh, generally, yes, and I think that's what we in the industry have been working to create. I think you're right to make the distinction and focus especially on, say, images, video, audio files. Um, there's a standard called C2PA that we and a number of companies now have been advancing. Uh, it has content credentials. It enables people to know where something was created, who created it. And I think you're right to know whether it was created by a person, by AI, or a person with the help of, say, AI. What should Congress think about allocation of federal resources for cybersecurity, and what should we consider when it comes to AI? Well, I would say that you know, AI, as you said, is both an offensive weapon and a defensive shield when it comes to cybersecurity. And as with many other things, the front line of this the last few years has been in Ukraine because Russia has such a sophisticated cyber attack capability. And you know, what we've found is a, a company that's been involved in supporting Ukraine since literally the moment that war began is that AI is a game changer. Um, you know, we have intercepted attacks against Ukraine faster than a human could detect them, and we blocked those attacks from taking place. So you deploy AI into, call it, the front line of the products themselves. Um, we have to recognize that the, it's ultimately the people who defend not just countries, but companies and governments, the chief information security officers or the CISOs. You know, so we've created what's called a cybersecurity co-pilot that basically automates for those individuals much of the workflow that takes their time so that they can be more effective and efficient. When it comes to federal appropriations, I think that, to put it simply, the United States government must remain at the forefront of having for itself the cybersecurity capabilities that it needs to defend the government. And every day, I mean, we are in government agencies today during this hearing, 
you know, pushing Chinese out of agencies and the like. And this will be happen every day of every year from now to probably eternity. So we must keep the US government well funded in this space. And I think we also need our intelligence agencies and especially the NSA to be well funded so they can remain at the forefront when it comes to global leadership in this field. Um, data centers put a strain on energy and water resources. However, unlike other businesses, they do not introduce many long-term jobs and economic benefits necessarily. So Mr. Smith, how many engineers do you have dedicated to model or hardware optimization to reduce energy use? And when you build a center, what initiatives do you have in place to reduce water use? Um, I don't know off the top of my head the number of engineers working on optimization, but I'd be happy to track down and, and answer and get it to you. Um, water use is a huge priority, especially uh, you know, in data centers, for example, in the southwestern United States and other countries around the world where water is in short supply. If you look at our data centers today, um, they run on liquid cooling. Uh, it's a closed loop system. The uh, liquid is a combination of, frankly, water and other chemicals. But basically, once it starts running, almost all of the water is recycled. So the amount of water that we consume is typically far, far smaller than what most people would estimate. We also have a commitment to water replenishment. Mm -hmm. now, our, our goal is to be water positive, meaning that we're providing more water to the community than we are consuming. So for example, across the United States today, we have more than 90 water replenishment projects, including one that focuses on the San Juan River in, in, in your state of New Mexico, which focuses on water security for the, the river. So I think it's a good example of how we can play a responsible role in addressing an issue that is of growing importance. Appreciate it, Mr. Uh, President Trump likes natural gas, but President Biden didn't. And if you build huge data centers and another president comes along who's anti-natural gas, um, that's a concern for you as you're deciding how to deploy capital. Mr. Smith, do you agree? Uh, generally, I do. I mean, I would, would say we need consistency across administrations in this country. Uh, we need to find more opportunities for bipartisan agreement. Um, and I'll just highlight that in Cheyenne, where we've long had a data center complex, um, you know, we do have backup generators that, you know, run on natural gas. So, you know, there are a variety of ways for us to put, you know, different energy supplies to good use. I was reading recently about this benchmark capital. I don't know these guys, but they evidently did a $75 million round for some, uh, an AI company in, in, um, in China. Is that another problem as well, Mr. Smith? Advantage energy problem, American companies financing our competition. I would connect three things, energy, people, and access to capital. The US has huge resources in energy, but never underestimate the ability of China to build a lot of electrical power plants, maybe more and faster than any other country. So we are better off going into that with the mindset that we have to keep up and not take anything for granted. But then I would say the number one comparative advantage of the United States throughout the 50 years that have defined digital technology has been bringing the world's best people to our country and giving them access to venture capital. And we should continue to burnish both of those. And I think you're right to ask where else is venture capital going. I'll just say this. If we can keep bringing the best people to the United States, and if we can keep educating the best people in the United States, I believe the money will be here to enable them to succeed. But let's make sure we're continuing to bring the best people in the world and giving them the opportunity to build great companies here in the United and States. And American venture capital funds funding Chinese AI, is that in our national interest? I think there's a, a really good question about whether it is, and I recognize that you all are quite rightly focused on that. I'll just keep saying, bring the people here, they will have access to the money, and we will outcompete the world. Great. If the United States doesn't adopt some standards through some entity, whether it's NIST or another federal entity or federally sanctioned entity, then um, won't other nations go ahead and feel the need to adopt their standards without any consultation uh, with the United States? 
Uh, I think it's a really important point you make, and it is the lesson from the evolution of privacy law. You know, the United States didn't adopt a national privacy law. Europe did twice, and most American companies of any size today apply across the United States work that complies with European privacy law. It's just more efficient. So I think the United States needs to be in the game internationally to influence the rest of the world. And you cannot be in the game if you do nothing. You must do something. So you take Senator Cruz's idea, a lightweight approach, yes. and then you build support around it. So just to unpack that, and I'll stick with Mr. Smith, uh, with apologies to everyone else because my time's limited. Um, would it be easier to shape the standards of other large economy countries that share most of our values if we already have a set of standards adopted? Generally, yes. I think we always have to be careful because if you go too soon, you go before the standards have really come together, but you've got to have some kind of model that you can show the rest of the world and win support for. And then presumably standards could be harmonized, right? They're not set in and in, in chiseled onto a, a tablet, so to speak, right? No, that's indispensable. I mean, if our right. technology is going to go around the world, we need a set of laws or regulations that, in effect, create that basis for reciprocity and interoperability. What role do you think Microsoft and other tech leaders have in developing uh, energy and particularly uh, the right type of energy? Um, I, th I think we have a tremendous responsibility to contribute to the solution, and I think Sam helped uh, with his list. I would highlight two things, and I just would, I guess, illustrate it uh, with what we do everywhere, but most recently um, with a major site in southeastern Wisconsin. You know, we went from zero, basically, to becoming the largest industrial user of electricity in the state, roughly 400 megawatts. And you know, so we worked with the local utility. We made the investment to ex help and really enable them to expand their electricity generation. Now, that electricity then needed to be delivered from their power plant through the grid to our data center. Um, we went to the Public Utilities Commission, and we proposed a rate increase on ourselves because we thought it was important that we pay for that improvement to the grid so that the neighbors, so to speak, would not have to. And I think what it really illustrates is the collaborative partnerships that are needed to provide the capital, to do the construction, to improve the grid, and to be, I think, very sensitive to the community as a whole. And what role we could play in Congress, in government, in terms of trying to accelerate and champion that AI adoption internationally? I think there's two things. The first is it just shines a light on the importance of getting it right for export controls, you know, which is the AI diffusion rule that's being discussed right now. And I think what it shows is we want to have, I believe, as a country, the kinds of national security controls that ensure that, say, chips don't get diverted to China or get accessed by the wrong users, say, in China for the wrong reasons. And that is something that people have drafted at the same, in, in, in the Department of Commerce. At the same time, we need, I believe, to say, get rid of the quantitative caps that were created for all of these tier two countries, because what they did was send a message to 120 nations that they couldn't necessarily count on us to provide the AI they want and need. And just think about it. I mean, if this is a critical part of your country's infrastructure, how can you make a bet on suppliers if you're not confident that they'll be able to fulfill your needs? So I think you in Congress and the Senate can help the White House and the Department of Commerce get this right. Mr. Altman, 